Hey, welcome everybody to Sunday nights here at Hope for Our Times. And uh, uh, let's get a really good one for you today. And uh, we're going to be talking about Daniel chapter 11, and this is how it ends. We're only looking at four verses tonight uh, because they are packed with power. So again, this is how it ends. You want to know how things are going to end? We're going to get there in just a minute. Hey, a couple of uh, things for you guys to know. If you want to join myself, Dr. Billy Crone, Pablo Frasini, and Eric Barger, we will be in Lake Stevens in Washington. That's uh, just a little bit north of Seattle. Uh, coming up in just a few weeks. Check it out at HopeForOurTimes.com. Uh, Friday night, Saturday, and I believe also Sunday. I'll be speaking uh, all day Saturday. So uh, looking forward to seeing you guys up there. If you can make it, check out the registration. You can go to HopeForOurTimes.com. Click on the events page to get that info. Also, on the events page, we have, by now you've heard about it, the Footsteps of the Apostle Paul trip that we are going to be doing. It's myself, Pastor Bob Probert, and let me tell you, it's going to be absolutely terrific. You can see there in the picture, uh, that's over in the area of Greece. Uh, we're going to be going to Greece. We'll see the Acropolis. We're going to uh, also be visiting Athens, of course. Going to get some of that Greek philosophy in there with Plato and the rest. We're going to go over to Corinth. We'll hit Mars Hill. We're going to be in Ephesus. Let me tell you, just fantastic. If you've ever been to Israel on a tour, then this is going to make sense to you because it's, uh, it's like that. It's education. And you go, but you get there. You're going to have a great time. You're going to be with like-minded people. You're going to sharpen one another, encourage one another. But it's like Israel, when you go there, suddenly you have the aha moments. Oh, that's what Corinth is like. That's what the Bema Seat, you literally see the Bema Seat that the Apostle Paul writes about to the Corinthians. So totally cool when you go there and you see that, you see Mars Hill, and you think of the book of Acts chapter 17. Um, so you go to these different places where, where the Apostle Paul is, addresses the people of Athens, and says, oh, you have all these other gods. Let me talk to you about the unknown God. So we're going there. Uh, and it's just, let me tell you, the, the, the whole trip just totally off the charts. I hope that you can join us coming up in September. We have the price really low for you, too, because we want to have as many people join us as possible. So uh, both those things, check them out, hopeforourtimes.com on, the, on the, uh, the website. And also, I want to encourage you, uh, to like and subscribe and share this video with all of your friends. Listen, it might not sound like a, a big deal to you guys. It might sound really trivial. It's huge to us because it's through the likes, subscribing, and the sharing that the algorithms pick up on it and will push the video out there to reach more people. So uh, that's why we ask you. It's a really big deal to us. It's free to do all of those things. And we really do uh, appreciate uh, your help with that. And I've been talking about Mexico a lot. We have some great opportunities coming up in Mexico and other places. I'll fill you in on those. We'll do a lot more detail coming up here next week with some of the outreach opportunities. And it gets a great way that, uh, uh, that we have. Listen, this is about the gospel. Ultimately, it's about the hope that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. We alert people to what's coming. We can see what's going on in the world where we can take the Bible and connect the dots, uh, but then that gets people to start thinking, well, maybe the Bible's true, and it leads people to an understanding of Jesus Christ. In fact, Bible prophecy is one of the best evangelistic tools that we have, and it was really through Bible prophecy that I eventually came to a relationship with Christ. So I guess that's why I love it so much, because it's, it opens up people to an understanding and wanting to know more about what the Bible says. So that's why we do what we do. So let's think about some things before we get into Daniel here in just a minute. Some of the things from this past week, we had this uh, bombing that took place, Israel uh, taking out a building right next to the embassy, right next to the Iran embassy uh, in Syria. That happened. Now there's this ma massive threat. My friend Greg Denham alerted me to this on Thursday. CIA said, hey, uh, there's only 48 hours it, Iran's going to attack Israel. So we have, listen, it looks like everything is escalating. We can see it all escalating, right? Uh, this isn't rocket science to look and go, okay, man, things are heating up. You got Gaza, you have the northern part of Israel. Um, then you, you have uh, just different other things. Uh, the IDF uh, canceled leave for all combat units in wake of Iranian threats. 
Uh, so you, you, you look, you know, I was, we were just over there in Israel. Some of you guys were there with us. We had a great time. And you look, you go, man, they are on high alert. Um, uh, we have Hamas chief rejects hostage deal compromise demands Israel withdraw from uh, Gaza. Qatar blames Netanyahu for hostage talks. Stalling Israeli officials. Qatar is playing the double game, which they are. We have all kinds of things going on. Check this out. 59% of American voters believe abortion should be legal in all or most cases. Wow. And then, I mean, you just look at these things happening over and over and over again. Some of the things that we're looking at in the news, um, some of the things that we really ought to have our concern, but really we look at the focus being on Israel right now. The world's attention is on Israel. Daniel chapter 11, the four verses we're going to look at now, they're really focusing on what's going on in Israel and the rise of Antichrist as we look at how things end. So uh, let's get it. Oh, I'm going to move this book. So I had this book up there. I was using it the other day to tell people how, remember when a few years ago we were told there's no such thing as Great Reset? And I said, well, I have this book by Klaus Schwab that says, hey, here's the Great Reset. Guess what? 2020 copyright World Economic Forum. And what, what a quinky dink. It gives all the details of how you go about a great reset, let's say based upon how things were going. So I'm going to replace that book with this book. There's, that's my first book, America in the New World Order. Because, man, wow, uh, look at where we are. Okay, enough of that. You guys ready? Let's get rolling. This is how it ends. Daniel chapter 11. We're going to look at only four verses for this message, but they are packed. Daniel chapter 11 verse 36 through 39. Well, let me start with the end of verse 35. At the end of verse 35, we are looking at Antiochus Epiphanes, and not just Antiochus, but the Greek empire after um, Alexander the Great had died. So we went through all of that history. You get to the end of verse 35, and it says this. I'll, uh, I'll just read all of, I'll tell you, I'll read all of verse 35. As some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white, until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Okay, what happens in verse 35 is a transition. It's about history past, but also all of a sudden we read about, well, wait a minute, until, look at this, the appointed time, the time of the end, for it's still the appointed time. So we immediately get launched into the future, future to Daniel, future to uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, and future to Israel, future to us right now. It's gonna, it launches us from this point on into the time of Antichrist. So verse 36 through 39 says, Then the king shall do accordingly to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished. For what has been determined shall be done. This is loaded. Now check this out. This verse 37 is where people really have an opinion on. And I'm going to tell you what I really believe is teaching here. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. What is that? Does this mean Antichrist is going to be a homosexual? Well, we're going to look at that in a few minutes. For what does this actually say? Nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses and a god which his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. What is this? Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign god, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Divide what land for gain? All right. A lot going on here, and we're going to break it down because I think you're going to get a really good understanding of how things are going to end. All right, so think of this here, all right? In, in Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through 35, they are all history. Uh, those are events that were fulfilled in the past. In verse 35, as I point out, we suddenly had a shift until the time of the end. So verses 1 through 35 are all history, events fulfilled in the past, Verse 36 through 45 are all future events not yet 
fulfilled. So what we are reading about right now is what's coming. And it's not just through verse 45. In fact, it's all the rest of Daniel from Daniel <clears throat> chapter 11, verse 36, all the way through to the end of the book of Daniel is all still future. But again, these four verses we're looking at tonight are just absolutely packed with information. So I want to uh, uh, move on from here and uh, cover as much territory as I possibly can. All right, now what's interesting with verses 1 through 35, so many Bible teachers will go through those scriptures and say, uh, and they'll, they'll um, uh, accurately um, interpret them. And they'll take those scriptures literally. When it comes to verse 36 through the end of Daniel, they suddenly flip into, well, we're not going to interpret these as being literal. We've decided these are allegorical. And when you go into it with allegory, suddenly they don't even make any sense. Why do they do that? Because those are the Bible teachers that don't believe in the prophecies regarding the second coming of Christ. So what they can see in history, verses 1 through 35, they say, yes, this happened with Alexander the Great and those that came after him. Verse 36 and forward, eh, let's just spiritualize it, allegorize it. Doesn't really mean what it says. That's just one more parts of the evidence that we have to take the Bible literally and suddenly it makes sense and we can tell how things are going to end. Again, we think of uh, Isaiah the prophet where God said, uh, in Isaiah chapter 46, he tells us the end from the beginning. Why? So that we can know what's coming. We, we can know what's going to happen to Israel. We can know what's going to happen with us. He tells us the end from the beginning. Amos chapter 3, God doesn't do anything unless he tells us through his prophets first. So he's given us the prophetic word, and that's what these verses are. They are prophetic, I believe, for right now and what's coming in the near future. So with that understanding, a couple more things I want to bring up. Uh, is this, why would you study a passage like this when what we're going to look at is about Antichrist? Well, let me give you three reasons why, right? Why would you study something about Antichrist? One reason is because it's in the Bible, so God put it here so that we would read it and study it. Why else would God have it? Hence, there's those who say it's allegory, just ignore it, ignore the book of Revelation, ignore the Old Testament, that kind of thing, right? No, it's here God wants us to study it. A second reason is because there's something that God wants us to specifically know. God wants us to know about these events that are coming in the future, or he wouldn't have it here. It, it, it's a warning. It's also a preparation. So when we see things begin to develop, we are strengthened, and we can also alert people. Also interesting, in chapter 11, verse 40, we're not going to be there tonight, um, because we're, we're stopping at verse 39, but it says this, at the time of the end, in chapter 12, verse 1, at that time there shall be trouble such as never was since the be there was a nation, since there was a nation of Israel. So you start looking at it, or since there was a nation, period, when we start looking at the coming tribulation, period. So again, God wants us to know what is coming at the end. Why? So we'd be able to connect the dots, so we would get it, and we would be like watchmen We would be for women. You'd be like a watchwoman telling people, hey, this is what the Bible says. This is why things are going like this. Hence, no matter what they say about the Great Reset, yeah, it really is here. And Klaus Schwab has a book about it. And no, we do not sell those in our store, just so you know. All right, now check this out. It's the same thing that Jesus is referring to in Matthew chapter 24, beginning of verse 21 where Jesus said, for then there will be great tribulation, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So it's understanding this. Number one reason we study passages like this, uh, and this one regarding Antichrist, is because they're in the Bible, and God put it here so we would read and study. A second reason is because God wants us to know something. So he puts it here. So we will know he's, he's, sh he's shedding his light. Uh, second uh, Peter chapter 1, verse 19, the prophetic word shines like a light in the darkness. And we live in a very dark world. And the third reason, because we can know the times in which we live, that we would prepare our hearts and keep ourselves ready because Jesus is coming. 
It is when you pr study prophecy, Bible prophecy, we prepare our hearts. We prepare our minds. We're going, wow, when we rightly, we have the right perspective of it, it gets us ready. It gets us excited. There's a, there's a crown for the, a reward for those who love his appearing. So we go, yes, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Hey, if it was good enough for the Apostle John, it's good enough for us. All right, with that being said, let's start breaking down this passage about this evil king, because that's who's being written about here, the Antichrist, in, in verses 36 through 39, and on through uh, the rest of this chapter. All right, number one, what do we have? We have the will of Antichrist. Look at this, verse 36, first part of it. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. So Antichrist will do what he pleases. He's going to be limited only because of God. God will say you can do this, but you can't do that. Kind of like when Job went to the Lord, the throne of the Lord, and he wanted to do this to Job and that to Job. And God said, okay, this is what I'll let you do, Satan. You can do this, but you can't do that. You have your limits. Satan even realized, hey, you put a hedge of protection around Job. Take down the hedge. So it's that, it's that same concept. Antichrist is going to be able to do whatever he pleases, limited only uh, when... Um, limited only uh, by what God says. And by the way, I said when Job went to the throne of the Lord, I meant to say when Satan went to the throne of the Lord to talk about Job. So, um, so let's move on from there, right? So these things do happen. That's what happens when you're doing something like this and you just start talking and it's not edited and you just go for it. All right, so Antichrist, he's not listening to anybody. He's not listening to his cabinet. He's not listening to his administration. He's doing according to his own will. In fact, his will is in harmony with the will of the devil. So think of this. Satan is, uh, he, he only copies, he's not an originator. He doesn't invent anything. He's a copycat, right? Uh, so he's going, as it was with God the Father and God the Son, the Son always did the will of the Father, so too. Satan uh, and Antichrist, Antichrist's father is the devil, Satan. Uh, Antichrist will do the will of his father, which is the devil. Revelation chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. John writes, I saw a beast, and on his head a, was a blasphemous name. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. So again, Antichrist is going to be doing the will of Satan, and he's got the power of Satan working in him. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 tells us the same thing. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan. So it is Satan who is empowering this man. It is Satan who had a problem with his will also, remember. It's Satan who said, Isaiah chapter 14, I will ascend to the heavens. I will be like the Most High. I will be like God. The lawless man, Antichrist, has the same problem of setting his will against God. And Satan has empowered his lawless one, Antichrist, to do his own will. Uh, he, uh, by the way, for those of you out there, there's some people out there who um, kind of feel sorry for Judas who betrayed Jesus in the in Gethsemane with a kiss and he went out and hung himself. So feel sorry for Judas. It's interesting to note that only two people are ever called the son of perdition in the Bible. Uh, Antichrist, the lawless one, in that passage in 2 Thessalonians, by the way, um, and also Judas, the, lawless, the, the uh, um, son of perdition. The only two people ever called son of perdition in the Bible, Judas and Antichrist. Isn't that rather interesting? So, don't feel sorry for Judas. I just wanted to say that before we move on any further. Um, but Antichrist is going to be honored and worshipped for it. So this is what Satan wants. I will be worshipped through this man that I am going to empower. I will exalt him. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 tells us, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High. 
Revelation chapter 13, verse 5 tells us he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He, we know here he does what he pleases, and what he pleases to do are bring big things against God and against the men of God. Can you imagine what's going to happen after the rapture of the church? If you think things are bad now, wait until after the rapture of the church. There's no hedge of protection. Uh, there, there's no restraining force anymore. Um, imagine after the genuine believers are raptured. Wow. Well, Revelation chapter 13 tells us a little bit more about Antichrist. It says this in verses 3 through 4. All the world marveled and followed the beast, so they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? So, number one, what do we have? The will of Antichrist. Number two, what do we have? The worship of Antichrist. So the Antichrist will place himself above everyone and everything else. He will show no regard for any authority except himself. He won't care about the best interest of people. He won't care if his policies harm people. He's going to do whatever he pleases. Don't we see that already in effect right now? Seems like the leaders, certainly here in America and in the Western world, pretty much the whole world, they don't care what harm comes to the masses of people. The people are subjects of theirs to be done as they please with, right? So Antichrist is going to be this and, uh, and even worse. He's going to do what he pleases. He won't be subject to anyone but himself. He's not listening to a cabinet, an administration, or anyone else, as I said. He's acting according to his own will. And also, that transfers over to his worship. So, in regarding his worship, A, he thinks only of himself. Now, this is quite interesting. Verse 37 says, He shall regard neither the God of his Fathers. Now, many people look at this and go, well, what does that mean? Well, the NASB says he shall show no regard for the gods of his fathers, as you just saw flash up there on the screen a second ago. So you see that and you go, you know, what's really going on here? The complete Jewish Bible says this. Very interesting, because I want to work through this. Antichrist Jewish? Is he Muslim? Is he Christian? What's his background? Look at this. Daniel 11, verse 37, complete uh, it's in the uh, complete Jewish Bible. It should say CJB, not CBJ, but anyways, you guys got it right. Um, CJB, complete Jewish Bible. He will show no respect for the gods his ancestors worshipped. Well, that helps us to understand a little bit more for coming from the complete Jewish Bible. In fact, every version that I checked, and I checked about 20 versions before before coming up here to, to teach on this, it translates this as gods with a little g, not God with a big G. Uh, the only versions I checked that have this translated as a, a God with a capital G is the King James and the New King James. And um, the rest of them were all a little g, as in God. So what does this mean? Well, very interesting. Uh, it could mean that is speaking of Jehovah God. Now, it's, it, it could mean, so work through this with me, uh, the God of Christians and Jews, or, as many others conclude, is likely referring to a pagan God, little g, or gods, right? Again, little g, uh, a religion that is not Jewish nor Christian that Antichrist grew up with. Some speculate that this is a small g, and Antichrist grew up with a Muslim background, but others, because this says God of his fathers, with a capital G, right, again, King James and New King James, say Antichrist must be Jewish. The reasoning of those who say he must be Jewish is because if he wasn't a Jew, then the Jews wouldn't receive him as their Messiah. Now, I want to say this. Not all Jews are going to receive Antichrist as their Messiah. In fact, we know that when he uh, presents himself in the temple of God, uh, in the temple as being God, it's at that point it appears, wow, there's an awakening that comes up over the Jewish people, and they say, this is not the Messiah. This is a bad guy. Listen, 
As Jesus came down Palm Sunday Road, he's presenting himself as the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. Uh, he said in Matthew chapter 23 to the same religious leaders who said, hey, don't let him say Hosanna. Don't let him say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Don't let them claim that you're the Messiah. Um, to the religious leaders, he said, guess what? At the end of Matthew chapter 23, check it out. He said, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, until you recognize me as Messiah. So when Antichrist sits in the temple and demands to be worshipped as God, many of the Jews are going to go, uh oh, they're, they're going to have an immediate spiritual awakening. Remember, there's already 144,000 Jews preaching, um, and, and uh, we have the two witnesses that have already been preaching. Now they're suddenly going to have this realization, this is not the Messiah. Guess what? The Messiah was Yeshua. They're going to have their, it's going to start, to, the real revelation of who Jesus is is going to really begin at the second half of the tribulation. Granted, the 144,000 are already preaching. Granted, the two witnesses are already preaching. But the real realization is going to come here at the midpoint of uh, the tribulation period. But I don't believe that this holds any water, this argument that Antichrist must be Jews, Jewish or the Jews wouldn't receive him. Um, listen, Israel's in a really strange position right now. With everything going on in Gaza, everything going on in the north, you want to avoid the scourge coming against you, you better enter into an agreement. Man, interesting, isn't it? Especially when you read something like Isaiah chapter 28. Wow, what days we live in. All right, let me keep going. All right, bottom line is this. The Antichrist will not worship Jehovah if he was brought up Jewish or Christian, nor will he worship Allah if he was brought up Muslim, nor will he worship any other god, little g, if he was Hindu or whatever it was, doesn't matter. Bottom line, he thinks only of himself and worships only himself. Here's a fact in regards to Antichrist. He will use the religion of the last days in order to gain his power with the 10 kings. And after he has his power, he's gonna get rid of that religion, right? He's not gonna have any competition. No way will he have any competition. In fact, the religion of the last days, known as the harlot, uh, who rides, the woman who rides the beast, the whole, the, uh, the whore system of Babylon, right? Revelation chapter 17, beginning of verse 16, says this. Um, the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. That's fascinating when you look at it. So what's it say again? It says they're going to, the 10 kings and Antichrist are gonna do away with this heartless system. They, they're gonna know it's a lie. Antichrist, according to Daniel and also Revelation, he's not gonna have any competition. There's gonna be no religion that's gonna stand before him. When it's said and done, They'll do away with that harlot system. Going to get rid of the whole harlot system, only Antichrist is worship. But then interesting, the very next verse, verse 17 says, God has put it into their hearts, the hearts of the ten kings, to do this, to raise up this harlot religion, to, to get the control they have, and then to do away with it, all of it. All of it, when you look at it, to... And to be of one mind, it says there in verse 17 of Revelation 16, that they would all be of one mind, give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. God is sovereign even as Antichrist is raised up. Antichrist, <clears throat> by the way, is a judgment upon the world. The world says, I don't want God. God says, okay, I will give you the man who you want. That's what you want. I will give him to you. And guess what? He is a judgment. You reject Jesus, you will get Antichrist. Okay, so what do we have? We have A, regarding worship, he thinks only of himself. B, he thinks he is the Messiah. Okay, now this is interesting, right? Because this is where you get into, is Antichrist homosexual? Is that what this teaches in Daniel chapter 11? Look at this. As with the God of the Bible, again, Satan's only, a, he's a copycat, he's not an originator. There's the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You also have Satan's unholy trinity. You have Satan, you have uh, Antichrist, and you have the false prophet, the un 
Holy Trinity. Satan is a copycat. He can only copy God. He, he's not an originator. By the way, you ever meet somebody and, and uh, you've, you've, do, you've done something, you've, you've come up with this idea, and you, you started to develop it and work it out, and somebody else comes along and takes your idea, claims it as their own, and everybody thinks it's their idea, they're a copycat. Listen, this is what Satan does. He's a copycat. He's not an originator. Can't come up with any of his own ideas, right? Very interesting. Anyways, here in verse 37, it says this. He will not have the desire for any women. Uh, it says here, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. What is that? So many have read that. And many of my friends, listen, and colleagues, I love them. They're brothers in Christ. And, but, and they'll say this teaches that Antichrist is a uh, homosexual. Um, listen, we, we live in a time. Let's work through this, all right? Hear me out, because some of you right now are going to get all mad at me and say, I don't know what I'm talking about. I do know what I'm talking about, all right? Um, so we live in this era of this heightened awareness of homosexuality in our culture. So a part of that reason why Bible prophecy teachers have jumped on that bandwagon is because of that. We gotta be really careful. There's another similar dynamic that happens in chapter 12. We're not gonna be there for a few weeks at least. Right, but, but look at this. Um, we gotta look at this in context, right? What is the context of this passage? The context of this passage has nothing to do with sexual orientation, right? The context of this passage is all about worship, Antichrist being worshiped, and the only God that he exalts. We're gonna see this in a minute. So the context of the passage is not about sexual orientation. The context is about Antichrist and worship of Antichrist, right? That's the entire context. Always remember context. Context dictates meaning. You don't take something out, pull it out, remove it from context and say it means this. That's what cults do, all right? So be careful in this. I know a lot of you have been taught this for years. Because this antichrist is homosexual, look at it, he must be. Listen, he still could be. Uh, we don't know. But that's not what this passage is about, all right? Just, uh, listen, I would rather be right in my Bible interpretation and have some people mad at me than be wrong in my Bible interpretation and have people praise me. Does that make sense? Kind of like, you know, just, just some of the things coming up. Uh, tomorrow we got the, the uh, April 8th, the, the eclipse coming up. Listen, we gotta be careful when we go, when we just, Stick, let's stick to the word. I'll, I'll just say that. I, want to, I don't want to say any more. Let's move on. All right. So the desire, listen, you won't have, verse 37, nor the desire of women. So what's the desire of women? It has to do with Messiah and who the Messiah is. Check this out. Let me bring up the complete Jewish Bible again. Look at this. Daniel chapter 11, verse 37 in the complete Jewish Bible. Um, again, it says CBJ, should say CJB, but hey, it is what it is, right? Complete Jewish Bible. He will show no respect for the gods of his ancestors' worship or for the god women worship. Very interesting, isn't it? Again, check it out for yourself. Complete Jewish Bible. He will show no respect for the gods his ancestor worshiped or for the god women worshiped. Wow. This helps us to see things in a different light than whether or not this is a passage about homosexuality. It is not a passage about that. It's about worship and antichrist worship. Now, check this out. Note, in Haggai chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says this, I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the, look, at there's that same word again, but with a capital D, Desire of all nations. This is an Old Testament name, desire of all nations, for Jesus. And likewise, the desire of women has to do with the Messiah. Who, what woman, what Jewish woman would not want to be the woman who gives birth to the Messiah to bring in the kingdom to the nation of 
Israel. This verse is teaching that Antichrist doesn't care anything about the Messiah. So the desire doesn't care anything about the Messiah because he thinks he is the Messiah. Again, look at the context. The context has nothing to do with sexual orientation. So much so that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, there's about him being worshipped. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right. So, almost done here. Not a lot left. Next main point. So what do we have next main point? It's the wars of Antichrist. There it is, the will of Antichrist, the worship of Antichrist, verses 38 and 39, the wars of Antichrist. Verse 38 again, in their place, he shall honor a god of fortresses. Ah, so we have a clue now. He does have a god, a god of fortresses. Well, what's that? I thought there was no other god that he, eh, you're going to see in a second, and it's going to make sense. He will honor the god of fortresses, verse 38, and a God which his fathers did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. Divide the land for gain. What is going on with all this? All right. To honor the God of fortresses means that he will place his confidence in military power. Listen, as you look at you, you look at this world, and you know what? We have, we have wars and rumors of wars everywhere. And as, as many politicians say, stop spending money on weapons. Stop, you know what? More money is always going to be spent on weapons. Ronald Reagan said one time, he says that, said there's never been a weapon uh, uh, that's been invented that hasn't yet been used. And you look at all the weapons that are out there, and it just keeps advancing, 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 even to the point now with drone and sworn technology and all that stuff that's going on. You look, you go, oh, wow, right? So massive. But you know what's strange that's happening? People are calling out now for a world leader that we can trust that will just bring an end to all the wars and rumors of wars, someone who will control all of the madness, control the whole globe. That is frightening. Because you know what? The Bible tells us something like that's going to happen. That is what's being described here in these last couple verses, verse 38 and 39. As we look at these, it's talking about something like that. And uh, listen, things are going to escalate. They're going to get worse and worse. Eventually, the rumors of wars will become massive wars. We know Revelation chapter 6, the massive war of the red horse. So we know these things are going to develop. So... As they develop, people are going to be crying out more and more, hey, we need a leader who can control all of this. And this guy right here that we're reading about is going to come along. Uh, and he will use <clears throat> his gold and silver. He's going to honor this God with gold and silver and precious things. Uh, so note here, A, under the wars of Antichrist, uh, he brings a face, a uh, fake peace begins his kingdom. We'll look more at, at this next time, um, but we keep hearing quotes like this. The world's looking for a someone to bring peace. Right now, Israel is really being backed up against a wall. The whole world is coming against Israel. Iran's coming against Israel. Uh, the, the America's coming against Israel. The whole world's coming against Israel trying to force them into uh, some type of peace agreement, saying, it's your fault, anti-Semitism is increasing. It's your fault, Israel. It's the Jews' fault. And Israel's going to be pressured, I believe, to eventually enter into some kind of peace and security agreement. But check this out. Remember Mikhail Gorbachev? For those of you who are as old as me, you'll remember. Remember he had the big old thing on his head, and birthmark, and people said, oh, he, that's the 666 right on his head. No, it's not. Anyways, he was the former president of the Soviet Union. At his news conference in Madrid, Spain, he said this, the victims of September 11 attack on the United States will not have died in vain if world leaders use the crisis to create a new world order. If we maintain a coalition, 
we could get a new world order desirable for all of us. Well, well, well. Isn't that rather interesting? Listen, we hear about this. Rahm Emanuel and many others have said, don't let a crisis go to waste. It was, oh, oh goodness, I can't remember. I think he's the fourth president of the United States. I'm drawing blanks on his name right now. Uh, but he said, um, he said, oh, I've got to think of what it is. He said, he said, a crisis is the rally cry of the tyrant. And, and that's what it is. It was uh, uh, Madison. It was, uh, yeah, I believe it was James Madison that said it. Um, if my memory serves me cor- correctly. Crisis is the rally cry of the tyrant. And this, uh, you know, Mikhail Gorbachev, hey, said we got to develop a new world order. And not just him, I mean president after president of the United States, world leader after world leader. Hence, why do you think we keep going through crises? Or fake crises, need I say more? Oh, we need a new world order. We need a leader. I've quoted Henry Spock many times here, saying, hey, give us a... a we don't care if he's the god or the devil. We need a leader, right? So we have this over and over and over again, and the world is being set up for Antichrist. All right, so fake peace begins his kingdom. B, real war defines his kingdom. We're going to see this more when we get to verses 40 through 45 next time, but the armies of the world are going to be gathered at Armageddon. He's not going to have victory over everybody. He's not going to have victory over Jordan. Very interesting. Uh, Some of Jordan, we're going to see that. He's going to really annihilate, just destroy some nations. He's not going to have victory over parts of the world. It appears, uh, when you look at it, some of the world that is currently Arab, he's not going to necessarily have victory over. They aren't necessarily buying into his plan They realize something's wrong. By the way, we know from Isaiah chapter 19 that many people uh, that are part of the Islamic world, they come to faith in the Lord God of the Jews. Interesting. Check it out. Read it for yourself. Isaiah chapter 19, because of their oppressor. So interesting dynamics take place. But real war defines his kingdom. Um, He wars with the nations early on. He will deal with anyone who opposes him. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, it reminds us that he deals with world leaders who will oppose him. He shall subdue or put down or humble three kings. We know that. And in Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, we read, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? So as people come up against him, he's going to seemingly shut them down. So he wars with the nations. He wars with Israel, Revelation, check this out. He wars with the nations and he wars with Israel. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 tells us the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. Uh, This is the time that Jesus speaks of when he says in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 21, there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be, and unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. It's also in this exact same context that Jesus says, hey, uh, w- when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, flee to the mountains. If you're in Judea, get out of there as fast as you can. Don't go back home to get your stuff. You better run as fast as you can. Woe to those who are pregnant. We saw what just happened. And the media is, the anti-Semitic comments, uh, we saw what just happened with women having babies cut out of their wombs over, uh, with the whole Gaza incident, Hamas, and people are denying it's true. No, Jesus is warning, guess what? Woe to those who are pregnant during that time. Woe to those who are, uh, pray that your flight isn't on the Sabbath. Why? Because in Israel, everything shuts down on the Sabbath, especially in Jerusalem. Everything shuts down. Public transportation, it shuts down. You can't get a cab ride. Uh, on, on Shabbat, unless it's from somebody who's Muslim. So pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath, uh, that you're not pregnant during that time. Again, the atrocities from October 7 should wake us all up. Stop denying those things. They really did happen. You know, it's, it's awful that people actually, the, the anti-Semitism is unbelievable. But this is what's being spoken of. So he wars with the nations. 
We'll see more of this next time because he's not going to beat everybody. He wars with Israel and he wars with Jesus. Guess what? We'll get into this next time because he's going to make a war with Jesus. And guess what? He loses. Jesus wins and it is awesome. Jesus is coming back. Listen, everybody. I know there's a lot in here tonight, uh, but it's packed in there. And I would rather rightly give you the Bible and maybe ruffle some of your feathers because it's not what you traditionally believe or what you were always taught. I'd rather rightly divide the word of God than, and ruffle a few feathers than have people happy with me but not rightly divide the word of God. Does it make sense? You know, ultimately, when we look at Bible prophecy, we can see all of these things developing that we're talking about Daniel chapter 11. The world is so set up for this. But ultimately, this is a reminder that the Bible is true. Everything's going along the way just as the Bible says it would. And it points back to the fact that Jesus came the first time to forgive us of our sins, that anyone who believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That's what the Bible teaches. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Listen, listen carefully, right? Every prophecy spoken of about Jesus in his first coming came true. Every single one. Such as he'd be born in Bethlehem, he'd be called out of Egypt, um, and, and on down the list. Even his betrayal, uh, even his, his uh, uh, ride on the donkey, Psalm 118, the people shouting, Hosanna, a prophecy about him when he's riding to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Every single prophecy about his first coming came true. And every single prophecy regarding his second coming, we can see it all converging now. And they just shouted us, listen, these are warning signs. And, and there's many of us that are out there warning. Some of you are too. We're watchmen on the wall saying, hey, everybody, pay attention. Look at what's going on. Jesus is coming again. Get right with the Lord because this time when he comes back, he's coming as a judge and the world's going to be judged for their sins. And listen, individually, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if he hasn't forgiven you of your sins, listen, if you don't know you're going to heaven when you die, then you're not going to heaven. Because if you know Jesus Christ, you know you're going to heaven. I implore you, as we see everything happening, it's not a coincidence that it all lines up with what the Bible warned us about. Ask Christ to forgive you of your sins. Give your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ and know this. He loves you. He came the first time for you that we'd be forgiven. He's coming back the second time as a judge. And it is not a coincidence that everything is taking place exactly as the Bible told us it was going to. Globalism, the world coming against Israel, the hatred of Israel, and right on down the list. Listen, thank you for joining us. Listen, if you would, please like, subscribe, and share this. Um, the algorithms, you know, it might not sound like a big deal, but it's a big deal to the algorithms to get the word out, and it's free to do that. So we really do appreciate it if you would do that. God bless you guys. Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and your ministering. For you are good. And I pray for anybody out there that's watching or listening, if they don't know you, Lord, use this to draw them to you that they would be saved. I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Listen, send us, you, you have uh, questions you'd like to send us or you want to know more about Christ or you prayed to receive Christ, whatever it was, uh, go to the, our website, hopeforourtimes.com. You'll see a uh, contact us and you can do that and it gives you a box there for questions. Just send that question and we'd love to uh, send something out to you or respond to you. Or you might want to find out if I'm speaking in your area, you can send a question in there too. And we'll answer that for you. God bless you guys. And oh, tomorrow, I forgot. Listen, Alan Didio is joining me. First time ever. Alan Didio is joining me. Two o'clock. And then Bill Fetter is joining me on Tuesday. And Wednesday is going to be off the charts. I have a great midweek for you. And then plus, I actually have a comedian from the UK that, that uh, we're going to be doing a program tomorrow. Uh, on Wednesday, excuse me, on the app exclusive, app only. So Join us again. Alan Didio is going to be joining us on Monday. God bless you guys.